kept from the record until late, till late 76 by contractual dispute, Wilson continued to seek out and nurture emerging talent such as Joe Joseph and the Falcons, the Sports and Wayne Gillespie, all of whom he produced and released on his own Oz label. He also found time to fully untether his songwriting from the 1950s as displayed dramatically by Living in the Land of Oz, a stark, damning song written in his mother's backyard, which in its assault upon white settlement, the white Australia policy and cultural myopia was as unsettling as anything Midnight Oil, Goanna, Red Gum and No Fixed Address would later serve up to a nation eager to feed its guilt complex. Now, interest in Daddy Cool in Australia has never really dissipated, as proved by a 1982 national top 20 chart reissue of Eagle Rock. Its celebration on a, by a postage stamp and its appearance at number two after Friday on My Mind on APRA's 2001 list of the all-time greatest Australian songs of the previous 75 years. On a good night when the mood takes him, Ross Wilson is likely to let fly with a crackerjack version of Eagle Rock, which invariably galvanises the audience. It is a song capable of filling a dance floor with frantic revellers within seconds of its arresting call to arms. Now listen. Today, almost 40 years on, the songs of Daddy Cool still ring true with a freshness and vitality that was largely absent from those ponderous, intense musical years of the early 70s. Now, if that was all that Ross Wilson had given us, I would still be up here inducting him into the Australian Songwriters Hall of Fame. But that was just part of his ouvert. His finger was never far from the national pulse. Cast your mind back to 1983, when his then-wife, Pat, was occupying the number one spot in Melbourne and number two spot nationally with Bop Girl, which Ross once declared to be the spiritual cousin of Eagle Rock, telling me it's the same message. I sang, now listen, we're stepping out. She sang, come follow me, I'll show the way. The title came from a trashy midday movie I saw in Adelaide in 1968. I intended to write a song called Bop Girl for about 10 years, but I didn't get around to doing it until Pat got a band together and I offered to write some songs. Now, it always helped to have an outlet, a vehicle, and that was certainly what Ross Wilson had with Mondo Rock, which he initially put together in August of 1976 to play the pubs of Melbourne, prolific in number and vast in size. He gave the Mondo concept another crack in November of 77, but it wasn't until August 78, two years from when he'd first introduced the name, that there were debut recordings, beginning with the single The Fugitive Kind and then the striking album Primal Park. It was a long trajectory. Mondo Rock, as we well know, would become one of the most polished, professional and reliable hit-making machines this country has known. A unit triumphant throughout the 80s. A new unit, in fact, co-fronted by the twin songwriting colossi of Ross Wilson and Eric McCusker. Eric kicked the first goal in 80 with State of the Heart, but then Ross cemented everything in place with the delicious, cool world. And thus they seesawed throughout their decade-long run. By the end of it, he had the Americans excited by his primitive love rights. Now, never really a prolific writer, and one even prone to bouts of blockage, Ross Wilson discovered the secret of making every song count. And some, come to ca some came to count more than others. Standing alongside Eagle Rock in the anthem stakes is A Touch of Paradise, which is as close to a ballad standard as Australian rock will ever have. Now, it has also been recorded internationally by Elkie Brooks and Jennifer Rush, who had the temerity to change the lyrics because she apparently didn't like flamingos very much. Seemed that they reminded her of Miami Vice. Now, written with fellow Ozrock stalwart Gulliver Smith of Company Kane fame, it was part of the Mondo's live set from the very first incarnation. 
We were a pretty rocky group, he once told me, but whenever we played that song, the whole room would stop dead and listen. We attempted to cut the song in our first album, but because we got so over-melodramatic with it on stage, it got overdone in the studio and we just couldn't pull it back. For a while, it didn't seem as if it was ever going to be recorded. Glenn Wheatley, who had Gulliver's half of the publishing, tried to get everyone who walked into his office to cut it. I remember Glenn Shorrock was talking about it for a while. John Farnham used to come and see the original Mondos at the Prospect Hill Hotel in Melbourne, and that's when he first heard the song and fell in love with it. He was the only one who understood what it needed. I'll never forget that Farnham, the Farnham concert with the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra where I came on stage and sang it with him. When they did Where No Angels, which I also wrote, my heart just about leapt through my brain because it sounded so fantastic. But then Ross's songs always do and always will. I store up titles, he once said to me about the song, Go Bongo, Go Wild. I work the process of completion backwards. And the reason I do that is because I think that the subconscious is throwing you these things for a reason. And then you come up with a chorus and then you write some verses. That's how it all comes together. A good title says it all. It's worth a million. It sounds like an accidental process, but the key is to take advantage of your accidents. Like one suspects he did with Bed of Nails 20 years ago, a song whose lyrics detailed the dues that this schoolboy enthusiast had paid in the minefield that is Australian rock. You remember the words, I'm sure. When I started out along the road, I put a young man's shoulder to the wheel. But now I've gotten older with the load, I recognise the hand that, make, that makes the deals. You sign your name, you pay the price, you never see the poison in the pen. They mark the cards and load the dice and you never know which way the game will end. Well, the game certainly hasn't ended for all the snakes and, and the ladders. Ross is still the boss. See him now with his urban legends or hear his recent tributary album and you're overwhelmed by the honed textures and by the incredible power of that mighty body of work. See him even as King Mondo with uh, the Wiggles and it's the same effect. Ross has been so integral to Australian rock of the past 45 years that you really can't imagine it without him. 